Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. This is a commentary from Matthew Henry, who is a nonconformist minister and author. Cheerful and obliging manners in showing kindness are great ornaments to piety. Though our condescending Lord vouchsafes not personal visits to us, Yet still by his spirit he stands at the door and knocks. When we are inclined to open, he deigns to enter. And by his gracious consolations, he provides a rich feast of which we partake with him. This is from Revelations 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Well, <laughs> the hyperlinked nature of those quotes is quite obvious. There's... 10 or 15 things being said at the same time, right? One is a reference to the idea that if you ask for something, it will be given to you, right? It was a very strange idea, but I like that idea a lot, and I believe, my, in my experience, that has been true if it was that I wanted what I was asking for, because that's the real issue, right? Because the question is, if you want something, what does it mean to want it? And what it means is to sacrifice whatever is necessary to get it, because otherwise you don't want it. And so there's an equation here, and I'm not claiming its ultimate accuracy, but the equation is something like, you don't want it unless you're willing to sacrifice for it. And if you don't want it, you're not going to get it, because you're scattered. But if you do want it and you make the proper sacrifices, then God only knows what might happen. And that's a, see, one of the things I really like about the existential philosophers is their emphasis on personal responsibility. You know, the, many of them had an emphasis on the role that people had in shaping their own destiny. The exist, for the existentialists, and I think this was a consequence of the religious substructure of, of philosophical thinking, it was self-evident that life was tragic and, and bitter. But... And then, fair enough, but that isn't where it ended. The, the next issue was, well, there are better and, ways, better and worse ways of dealing with that, and the better way of dealing with the fact that life is tragic and bitter is to posit the self you could be and live authentically in relationship to that. And then the next issue, and some, this is something Kierkegaard talked about, particularly when he talked about the necessity of being a knight of faith, is that the thing is, and this is, I think, part of, the life, part of life that's the intractable adventure. No one can take the adventure of life away from you. That, that's, they can't do it with good advice, for example. Because no one can demonstrate to you that if you straighten yourself out and aim at what you want and make the proper sacrifices, that your life will turn out in the manner that you might want it to turn out. It isn't in anyone else's purview to make that judgment. The only person that can possibly figure that out is you. It's something that can't be stolen from you. I would say it's your destiny. It's a destiny that cannot be stolen from you. And you can forego it. You can say, well, I'm not willing to put in the effort because what if I fail? Well, first of all, if you don't put in the effort, you will fail because life is hard and it, it takes everything out of you to do it properly. So you will fail. And if you make the proper sacrifices. You might fail. That's why I like the ambiguity in the story of Cain and Abel, because we're never really told why God rejects Cain's offerings. There's hints that Cain maybe isn't doing as good a job as he should, and he certainly gets bitter about it, but there's no smoking pistol. It doesn't say, well, Cain is a bad guy, and he made terrible sacrifices, so God rejected him. You never know. Cain might have been working pretty damn hard, and things still didn't work out for him, and I think that ambiguity is appropriate in the story, because that ambigu ambiguity is in life. You'd, you'd, you'd be a fool to say that Everything always works out for everyone if they just do things right. I mean, I think that's a, very, that's a very careless thing to say, given how much tragedy and catastrophe there is in the world and how much of it seems to be undeserved. But that still has very little bearing, I think, on, on, on your own individual adventure and the necessity, for, the necessity for opening the door to who you could be and, and the necessity to do that seriously. And I do believe, and, and I, think, I, I think that's why this most impossible of verses, you know, knock and the door will open, why that's believable is that I have never met anyone who couldn't hypothesize a better them in some manner. 
All they had to do was ask. It's like, well, how could you be better? I think, well, here's three ways. It's like, it's no problem, right? You can think about that in no time flat. Maybe it's small ways, but you can almost always at least think of something stupid that you're doing that you could quit. And so that means that you do have this, it's a strange thing in people, that we have this built-in capacity to posit a higher self and then to move towards it. And maybe, maybe that's part of where the religious instinct really came from. Speaking like really reductionistically, like as a materialist, as an evolutionary psychologist, we, we have this notion of the transcendent ideal, right? That, that seems to be pervasive across cultures. Well, maybe that's the ultimate manifestation of the human proclivity to be able to posit an ideal at all. And to move forward, you pause it an ideal. Okay, that, you need that to move forward. Well, if you can pause it an ideal, why can't you pause it the ultimate ideal? Well, if you can, then instantly you've got a religious sensibility. Instantly. And so maybe that's the, because I've puzzled, like, as a biologist, what the hell's the basis of the religious instinct? Because the idea that it's mere superstition, like, we can just dispense with that. That's wrong. It's a human universal. You can evoke religious experiences all sorts of ways. So, we're not going to play that game. There's, there's some reason that that instinct exists. And this, the first thing to do with it is to try to reduce it to something that's biological and leave it at that, not to mess with the metaphysics. But it certainly could be the case that it's the ultimate extension of our capacity to posit an ideal. And we also might say, well, that's good enough, because while well, the ideal moves you forward, it fills your life with meaning. There's no doubt about that, because it is in the movement towards your ideal that life's meaning is to be attained. And then the question is, well, how much meaning is there in moving forward towards an ultimate ideal? Well, more meaning, even though it's more difficult. How much? Well, that's the open question. <laughs>